And so now I also get to introduce our guest speaker for the morning. She has been the host of HD, HGTV's number one show, House Hunters, for nearly 10 years. Uh, many of you have seen that. And also, she played the outrageous character Polly on the NBC series Las Vegas. Yes. This woman is a stand-up, an award-winning stand-up comedian, a published author, a student of the science of mind philosophy. But most important of all, remember the DVD, The Secret? She's the person that introduced it to Oprah Winfrey. <laughs> so we know what happened after that. Wow. So thanks for noticing that. And by the way, her name is, and please join me in welcoming, Suzanne Wong. <laughs> Malibu Winter Youth Camp. <laughs> Good morning. Happy New Year. Let's hear it one more time for James Higgins. Oh, you raised me up. That was like a spiritual swing. Thank you. Um, hi, I'm Suzanne Huang, and I'm Asian. Thank you. Can I get an aha? Uh -huh? Uh, any other Asians in the house? What, what? Yellow power? Don't raise your hand, Grayson. Um, OK, just to save time for later, I thought I would answer some of your most frequently asked questions now, up front. Ready? One, no, I don't do manicures. <laughs> Two, uh, no, I don't know karate. And three, actually, I'm an excellent driver. <laughs> Swear. Swear. Uh, you know what really uh, pisses me off is when I'm driving in LA well, and I'm on the 405, let's say, and someone's doing some terrible driving, and I can't help myself. Do you ever do this? And I pull around to look inside to see who's driving, and it's an Asian man. And I'm like, no, no, you're ruining it for all of us. Stop it. Um, I like to call myself a crazian, which is my word for a crazy Asian. Um, so feel free to refer to me that way. Who here, by a show of hands, is good at math? Good at math. OK. So I made a profound discovery about God using the transitive property of mathematics. OK? So if you don't know, the transitive property of mathematics states that if A equals B and B equals C, it follows that A equals C, right? OK. So therefore, since God is me, and I am an Asian woman, it follows that God is an Asian woman. <laughs> Woo! Right? And that means that they need to change all those drawings of God in churches now. I would like to say thank you to Reverend Dr. David Fears for asking me to be your speaker today. I'm thrilled and honored to be giving my first <coughs> guest sermon. Also, thank you to Teresa and Shem and Lisa and Sue for all of their help in making it possible for me to be here. Um, in case you don't know, Reverend David is in Thailand. Did you know that? Yeah. He's at the Elephant Sanctuary Being of Service, which sounds amazing. I really want to do that. Um, so I go to an RSI church called the NoHo Center for New Thought in North Hollywood. Um, I go to UCRS retreats over at Asilomar. I also go to Agape, and I go to Abraham Hicks seminars. So I'm basically a science of mind <laughs> slut. <laughs> Can I get an uh -huh? um, I am a universal life minister, and instead of calling me reverend, you can call me irreverend. <laughs> In case you don't know, Koreans are the funny people of Asia. It's true. It's because we're the little Asian country that all the bigger Asian countries like to pick on, so we have to use humor to rise, raise ourselves up above the adversity. Right, James? So for example, um, Margaret Cho, Korean, funny. Suzanne Wong, Korean, funny. Right? Yoko Ono, 
Japanese. <laughs> Not funny, right? <laughs> so my grandfather was actually a famous Korean minister. His name was Hwang Chae Kyung, and he traveled all over the world preaching. He, he was famous for doing the Voice of America radio show. I'm known in the Korean community as his granddaughter because he was that famous. Um, and he used to travel to many different countries. He collected ancient musical instruments from 60 different countries and learned how to play all of them. He was a magnificent human being. He used humor in his sermons, so he was quite controversial because some of the Koreans would say, you know, church no funny. And he would say, only way get people stay awake. <laughs> he was right, I think. So anyway, when I was a little girl, I wrote a birthday card to my grandfather. I was just learning to read and write Korean. And so there's all the different characters and the consonants and vowels. And I wrote, happy birthday, grandfather, in Korean. And the Korean word for grandfather is harabaji. Harabaji. I wrote by accident, harabaji, by mistake. And I gave him the card. And he read it and fell off his chair, laughing hysterically. And I didn't know what was so funny. And apparently, in Korean, boji means vagina. <laughs> So the birthday card said in Korean, happy birthday, grand vagina. <laughs> Isn't that what every minister wants to be called? Yeah. <laughs> so the title of my talk today, if you read your programs, is start the new year with a spiritual colonic. Now, it's a very exciting time to be a human being on this planet. I believe that there's a major shift in human consciousness that's happening. And we've chosen to all be here right now. We are giving birth to a new version of ourselves, and I think it's very exciting. And just so you know, if you had a rough year last year, don't fret, because guess what? When you give birth, giving birth, I don't know this firsthand, but I hear that it's extremely violent and bloody and painful. There's a lot of screaming and pain. And then on the other side of it is this beautiful new life. And so we're in the middle of this transition. So just, just take a breath and know that everything's OK. And we are, we are on our way to something incredibly glorious. Now, has anyone here ever had a colonic? <laughs> and admitting it, e excellent. So. I had never heard of a colonic before the movie L.A. Story, remember, with yeah. Steve Martin, right? And Sarah Jessica Parker says to Steve Martin, want to go get a high colonic on our first date? And I'm thinking, what is, I don't know what that is. So um, here's the definition of a colonic. The injection of large amounts of liquid high into the colon through the anus for cleansing purposes, for stimulating evacuation of the bowels, or for other therapeutic or diagnostic purposes. So a friend of mine told me that I should try it. So I did, because I'll try almost anything once. And now I've been getting them on and off for years. In fact, I got one yesterday. Can I get an uh-huh? <laughs> so here's why people get it done. Apparently, we are basically human waste baskets. Like, uh, our intestines are filled over the years if you've ever, ever eaten anything that wasn't great for you. There's residue, like, um, you know when your drains get clogged in your sink and you know the water starts to go through really slowly because there's all this buildup? That's what happens in our intestines. So, so, <laughs> stay with me. Don't try not to leave the room. Uh, sh you shouldn't do them too often. And you should take probiotic or acidophilus to balance yourself out. But here's what happens. First of all, I can't believe that there are people who want to give colonics for a living. That's fascinating to me. So you go, right? And you're wearing the little um, you know, paper gown with the back open. And you lie on this table. And uh, they basically stick this tube into your rectum. And uh, that in and of itself is fascinating. <laughs> and um, then they put pump alternating warm and cold water up into your um, large intestine, right? And you're sitting there like, wow, this is the most bizarre thing I've ever experienced. And then when you feel this pressure building up like you're going to, you know, you need to eliminate, <laughs> Um, you're supposed to tell the colonic therapist, and then they reverse the direction of the water. And basically, you're supposed to just allow yourself to crap on the table. <laughs> but it's not going to go all over the place. It's going to go through this tube, right? This glass tube, which actually shows you what's going to go by, like it's rectal theater. <laughs> and then they analyze what's going by. I'm not even kidding you, you guys. So you look at what's going by. You watch the rectal theater, right? 
but guess what? When you're an adult, everything inside you says, oh, uh, you're not supposed to take a crap on a table. <laughs> so your body's like, no, 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 no. I don't think so. No, 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 no. And finally, you have to just go, uh, uh, all right. And then it just goes, right? So uh, after um, anywhere from 20, in my case, 20 minutes, other people, 60 minutes, because after 20 minutes, I'm like, I don't want to do this anymore. Um, of the water going, you know, back and forth and just continuing to flush more stuff out, um, they put in one final, you know, woo, up your intestine, and then you run to the bathroom and you pull out what's called a well step, which is this thing that helps your um, feet prop up more, so you're in a squatting position, which helps you eliminate better, right? Because we used to squat in holes before we, you know, started to sit on these <coughs> civilized toilets, which help us not eliminate completely. So anyway, you go into the bathroom, you sit on the well step. And for me, personally, it's like this poop rocket ship comes out of you. It's like, oh, I feel like I'm going to shoot through the ceiling, right? And the whole thing is so bizarre. But I have to tell you, it's really uncomfortable and awkward, but afterwards, you feel euphoric. I, I had to ask, too. I asked my colon therapist. I said, what are the weirdest things you've seen in rectal theater? She said, I've seen goldfish. I've seen paper clips. What? Anyway. So it's probably the strangest, funniest, most awkward, uncomfortable, and ultimately euphoric thing uh, I've ever experienced, which is a lot like what my spiritual journey has been. <laughs> Strange, funny, awkward, uncomfortable, and ultimately euphoric. So to me, colonics are a great metaphor for my spiritual journey. I need to get all the crap out of the way and allow my divine energy to flow freely through me. My true nature, my true God self is underneath all of my human crap. Marianne Williamson once said, spiritual progress is like detoxification. Things have to come up in order to be released. Once we have asked to be healed, then our unhealed places are forced to the surface. I feel like this is what's been happening a lot lately for us as individuals and as a human race. So we all need to give ourselves spiritual colonics on a regular basis to stay healthy. It's about opening up our spiritual rectums so that more God light can shine through. So now I present to you pieces of crap and ways to release them. Can I get an uh-huh? Uh -huh. OK. Crap number one, fear. How can you cleanse yourself of fear? Well, there's no fear in the present moment. Fear is a projection that something bad is going to happen in the future. But the future doesn't exist. And right now, everything's fine. And right now. And right now. So if you just stay in the present moment, your fear vanishes. A great way to get in the present moment is to do this right now. Take a deep breath. <sighs> Let it out with a sigh. And just feel the weight of your body standing on the floor or sitting on the chair. Try this grounding exercise. Start with the top of your head. Put the hands on, your hands on the top of your head. And just slowly take all your energy all the way down your body and ground it into the floor. I love doing that. You can also try meditating, or you can play with your dog. Anybody have a dog? Yeah. OK, so you know. We can learn so much from dogs, can't we? My, I, have a, I have a pug named Bonsai. I adopted him. And I, I learned so much. It's so simple. Life is so simple if you could be like Bonsai. Because every time I come home, he goes, oh my god, you came home? That's the greatest thing ever. Oh my god. It's the best. But I come home, all, I mean, all the time, multiple times a day. Endlessly enthusiastic, like he's never seen me before in his life, right? Imagine if we did that to our loved ones every time they came home. Oh my god, you came home? That is the greatest. And every time uh, he's fed any food, he's like, oh my god, food? I love food. Food is the best. Thank you for food. <laughs> Imagine if you, people did that at a restaurant. The waiter came and you're like, oh my god, food? Food? Food is awesome. So. Another helpful activity is laughing. When you are laughing, you are in the present moment. You cannot be laughing and be stuck in the past or projecting the future. So try this affirmation with me. Life is hilarious and all is well right now. Life is hilarious and all is well right now. Perfect. Crap number two, <laughs> anger. OK, Asian women can be walking time bombs because we've been taught to suppress our anger. The angriest I ever saw my mother, she did this. She flared her nostrils just a tiny, <laughs> tiny bit. That was her at her most livid. So you can imagine that was my model for expressing anger. So I 
suppress mine for many years. And then, of course, one day I snapped and I swung the pendulum the all you know the other direction all the way, and I just started to lash out at everyone and everything. Also not so healthy. So now I realize that if I'm hysterical, it's historical. A little twelve-step thing I learned. So if something happens, someone says or does something, and I get hysterical, it's probably historical, meaning I've probably been triggered about something from my past being re-stimulated. But the good news is there are healthy ways of releasing anger. You can write a venting letter to the person that you'll never send to them and then rip it up and burn it. I like that one. Uh, you can share with a trusted friend or a therapist or a mentor or a sponsor. You could punch a heavy bag, which I'm looking forward to doing more of. Uh, you could exercise. You could primal scream. You could take a plastic bat to your mattress. Whatever you need to do to get your anger out. Your anger just wants a little stage time, and then you can let it go. If you don't let it go, it can lead to illness, insanity, road rage, violence. I'm sure you know at least one of those. So experiment with healthy ways of releasing your anger. And try this affirmation with me. It's two parts. I am grateful for what my anger teaches me. I get the lesson and I release it. I get the lesson and I release it. Okay. Crap number three. Resentment. I've heard that resentment is like drinking a glass of poison and then waiting for the other person to die. Yeah. <laughs> what? So guess what? The people that you resent, usually they don't know or they don't care. So you're the only person that's suffering. So how about let it go? Just take the poison, pour it down the drain. Stop drinking that. I love you, sir. I love you because you're so open and present. Thank you very much. Um, so the antidote to resentment is what? Forgiveness. Reverend Michael Beckwith once said recently, if you want a black belt in spirituality, you must forgive everyone, everything, all of the time. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Easier said than done, right? But forgiveness is not for the other person. It is for you. So here are some techniques you can try. You can start by, if you're angry at that person, try, start with a venting letter where you write them, you know, I hate your guts and I hate your whole family, and then you rip it up and you burn it, right? And then you write an ideal response letter from that person back to you. What do you need to hear from that person? I'm so sorry, I was jealous of you, I was doing the best I could, it's because of my upbringing, or whatever you need to hear from that person. And then you sign it from that person, so it's written to you. And then the third letter is a forgiveness letter, because now that you've vented your feelings, now that you've gotten the ideal response that you've created for yourself, forgiveness is just like a, it's like a divine scissors, where you're now going to cut that toxic energy from infecting your life. So another idea is you can try imagining the person you resent as a little child who had some bad experiences and just try to have compassion. You can also try seeing whoever you resent through the eyes of your God, your source energy, or your higher power. See them as a child of God who's just doing the best they can. You could also try thinking of five things, right, Linda, that you appreciate about that person, right? And another tip, don't go to the hardware store for milk, another lesson I've learned. So here's the scenario. Say I go to the hardware store, and I say, I'd like a gallon of milk, please. And the hardware store guy goes, uh, we don't sell milk here. And I go, I want a gallon of milk. <laughs> and he says, uh, once again, ma'am, uh, we don't sell milk here. And I freak out, and I scream, and I want milk, and I keep screaming about it, and I'm knocking things over. Who's the crazy person in this scenario? The hardware store guy or me? Me, right. So the analogy is, is like this. So say, uh, say there's somebody in your life who tends to be sort of angry, bitter, negative, right? And you go to that person expecting love and support and kindness and nurturing. Isn't that sort of like going to the hardware store for milk? They don't sell that there. So don't go there for that. Go to the grocery store. Call somebody who sells that. Do you know what I mean? OK, so try this affirmation. I forgive everyone everything all of the time. Crap number four, blame. So I've heard that whenever you're pointing a finger at someone, there's three pointing back at you. So take full responsibility for your reaction to anything anyone says or does. 
Eleanor Roosevelt once said, no one can make you feel inferior without your permission. I also love the story about this. there's a man sitting under a tree, and there's a pigeon in the tree, and the pigeon craps, and it lands on his head. And the man gets furious at the pigeon. How dare you? I can't believe you did this to me. How could you do this to me? But guess what? The pigeon didn't crap on his head. The pigeon crapped, and he was standing under it, right? So what can you do? You could, ooh, not stand under the pigeon that's in the tree, right? Guess what? When you squeeze an orange, you get orange juice, right? When you sit under a pigeon, you can get crapped on. So that's, that's on you. One of my favorite stories is this Zen Buddhist is walking through the forest, right? All peaceful, having a nature walk, all in bliss. And this abusive man comes up to him and starts swearing at him and degrading him and screaming at him and just spewing bile. And the whole time, the Zen Buddhist is just perfectly fine. And eventually, the abusive man just walks off in a huff. And uh, the Zen Buddhist just keeps walking. And this third man who saw the whole thing comes over to the Zen Buddhist and says, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to eavesdrop, but that man was horrible to you. And somehow you seem fine. How is that possible? And the Zen Buddhist says, let me ask you a question. If I get you a gift, and I wrap it up, and I present it to you, and you refuse to accept it, who does it belong to? And the man said, it would still belong to you. And the Zen Buddhist said, exactly. I just chose not to accept his gift. <laughs> so to me, that is such a simple but profound story, because abuse, or anything anyone says or does, is you can think of it as a gift, that you have the choice to accept, eat it, drink it, take it in, rub it all over you, or just go, uh, no thanks, no thank you, you can keep that. You know what I mean? You, you really can do that, it's very empowering. And you should try it, because it's really annoying to the person who's trying to insult you. <laughs> no, Suzanne, you're stupid, fat, and ugly. No thanks, you can keep that. That person had head explodes, right? If I take it in and I go, oh my god, I am stupid, fat, and ugly, oh no, then that person gets happy because they released it and I accepted it. So you can be like Teflon. Be like Teflon. Just let it roll off of you. Marianne Williamson said, everything anyone says or does is either an expression of love or a call for love. Wow, that makes me emotional. So the only appropriate response is always love. <clears throat> so try this affirmation. My only response is love. My only response is love. Whew. OK, crap number five. <laughs> scarcity. If you're feeling a lot of scarcity, oh, the economy, everything's terrible. Did you watch the news? Ah, ain't it a shame? Oh my god. And if you think your life is terrible, it's good to take an action that gives you perspective on your problems. I love this saying, instead of telling God how big my problems are, I tell my problems how big my God is. So I like to refer to astronomy in situations like this. So our entire galaxy is one trillionth of all of space as we know it. So you are one person on a planet in a galaxy, and the entire galaxy is one trillionth of all of space. So do your problems still seem huge? <laughs> also, you could try volunteering at a homeless shelter, a children's hospital. Be of service. It really changes your outlook to serve some clear broth to a person where that's all they're going to eat all day long and they don't have any place to sleep. Or sing a song to a child in a hospital who's got some really challenging illness that they're going through. At the LA Mission, on Easter, Thanksgiving, and Christmas when I'm in town, they have a foot washing tent. And uh, most people don't want to go anywhere near there because they're skeeved out about feet. But basically, Jesus washed the feet of his disciples. Um, and it was hearkened back to that. The idea came from that. And so uh, you kneel down, and the, the people come, and they sit. And you take off their shoes, if they have any, and socks. And you, you have a fresh basin of water, and you wash their feet with soap and water, and you clip their toenails, and you put lotion and massage and powder. And then a company called Etnies donates 3,000 pairs of socks and new sneakers. And it's such an incredible experience. It's so moving because I can't get through a day of doing that without crying and just being humbled and really having a connection. Because when you give food to a homeless person, that'll be good for a few hours. But that experience is, is really beyond the beyond. Um, OK, so try this affirmation. It's two parts. I look for reasons to feel good. I 
My life is abundant with blessings. Okay, crap number six, self-righteousness. Some of us, including myself, just love to be right. I was once asked, would you rather be happy or right? And I said, I'd rather be happy that I'm right. <laughs> Stupid question. But it's so true, you know. How ask yourself, how important is it, whatever you're talking about with somebody? I've used my attachment to being right as a weapon. I realized this, you know, not too long ago. It was my way of over overcompensating for the fact that I was always the smallest in school and always being picked on for being Asian, so I'd fight back you know, as being right with my brain. I was always rewarded for being right, too, because I was valedictorian of my high school, and people applauded me for getting straight A's. And when you get straight A's, that means you got the right answers all of the time. So I got rewarded for that. But now as an adult, it doesn't serve me. So how about this? Don't give unsolicited advice. If someone's confiding in you about something they're going through, don't jump in to fix it or save them or have the right answer. Wait for the question. If they don't ask for your opinion or your advice, don't give it. Maybe they just need someone to listen to them, and they'll come to the realization all by themselves. When I act like a know-it-all, it alienates the people around me, and it prevents me from learning anything. So try this affirmation. Uh, look at someone next to you and say, I choose happiness over righteousness. I choose happiness over righteousness. OK, crap number seven, judgment. When I judge someone else, I'm judging myself because we are all one. So whatever I hate in somebody else exists in me. Anytime I feel a judgment coming up inside of me, I try to say to myself, he is me, she is me. It's become sort of a mantra to help me be an acceptance of other human beings, no matter where they are in their journeys. Who am I to judge where someone else is in their journey? I wouldn't have appreciated someone judging my journey 15 years ago before I ever heard of science of mind. My job is just to sweep my side of the street. Another saying I love is put down the magnifying glass and pick up the mirror, because that's a full-time job. A lot of us have the magnifying glass, and we're like, I know everything that's wrong with every one of you. And boy, are we going to have to spend a lot of time fixing all this crap, right? Put that down, pick up the mirror, whoa, full-time job. Plato said, Time will change and even reverse many of your present opinions. Refrain, therefore, a while from setting yourself up as a judge of the highest matters. So turn to the person next to you and say, you are my mirror, and I accept you exactly the way you are. <laughs> No, no side talking. No side talking. OK, and for the final piece of crap, crap number eight, control. Whenever I feel the need to control a person or a situation, it's time for me to remember the law of detachment from Deepak Chopra's seven spiritual laws of success. When I try to control or force solutions, my intention gets locked into a rigid mindset, and I lose the fluidity and the creativity and the spontaneity that's inherent in the field of all possibilities. I interfere with the whole process of creation. It is much better to embrace uncertainty while I expectantly wait for the solution to emerge out of the chaos and confusion. Isn't that beautiful? That comes from a from his book. <clears throat> OK, so try this affirmation. Two parts. Detachment and uncertainty are my path to freedom. And the field of all possibilities. So those are my eight pieces of crap and how to do a spiritual colonic. If you clear this crap on a regular basis, you will be blissful, I guarantee you. Now, uh, how many parents do we have in the house? Wow, a lot. OK. I would like to tell you to support your kids whatever their dreams are. Don't force your unrealized dreams upon them. They came through you, but they don't belong to you. OK? Also, whatever you repress the most in your kids is the very thing they will act out the most as soon as they leave, I promise you. So just think about that. And to the teenagers, my Malibu winter youth campers, anytime you guys are angry at your parents about anything, remember, they're just human beings. 
They're doing the best they can based on their upbringing and their life experiences. And you will know that you've really grown up when you realize this. So try to have compassion and appreciation for them, even when they get it wrong for you. My parents were magnificent. I, they're not dead. They are magnificent. But the way they raised me was really spectacular, and I didn't realize how unique it was until I got a little older and started visiting other friends' houses and going, oh, no one's parents are like this. My parents told me every day that I'm beautiful and wonderful and magnificent and talented and kind and that I can accomplish anything that I want to in the world. And they told me they loved me and they hugged me and they kissed me and they made me laugh. Every day, this is what I got. And I believed them. And my life is a manifestation of that core belief that they instilled in me. My life is a legacy of that. So that's the best thing you could possibly teach your children. Um, God, I feel like I'm going to cry through this whole talk. <laughs> Woo! OK, so I would like to close with um, my favorite story and uh, with a song, because I think I have time, which is so amazing. All right, so the story goes like this. Some of you know this story, so you can just watch the other people's reaction to the story. OK, <laughs> so in October of 2006, I watched this movie, The Secret, the DVD of The Secret. And I loved it so much that I started like jumping up and down and clapping and laughing and running around my living room. I was so excited about this movie. I thought, this is mainstream enough and people will understand it and it's put together well and it's perfect. It's not under people's heads. It's not over their heads. I'm so excited. So I went on the website and I, bought, I spent $3,000 of my own money buying 100 copies of this movie for everybody that I love. And then I decided, I should send this to Oprah Winfrey. And you know, the little demon voice goes, no, that's a dumb idea. Don't send it to her. She'll never get it, or she's already seen it, and that's stupid. And I went, shh, right? I just said, no, I'm just going to send it. So I wrote her a letter, Dear Oprah, my name is Suzanne Huang, and I host House Hunters, and gave her a little background. And I said, Oprah, I saw you once on Larry King Live, and you said you had read Marianne Williamson's book, A Return to Love, and you loved that book so much, you bought a 1,000 copies of it and gave it to everyone that you love. I'm doing that on a smaller scale with a DVD called The Secret. It's a documentary about the law of attraction and quantum physics. It's the way I live my life. I believe it's the way you live your life. My dream is that you will watch it, you will love it, and you will do a show about it. And then I signed it Blissings, because I like to make up words, and blissings are even better than blessings. So I wrote <laughs> Blissings, Suzanne Huang. Right? Yay. So then I sent it off, and I forgot about it. A month and a half later, I'm driving in my pimped out Prius, I, I, it's, out, it's out there. If you saw it, I got it custom painted bright yellow. I got chrome rims. And uh, I got a, a license plate frame that says a yellow girl needs a yellow car. <laughs> right there. So I'm in my, I'm in my pimped out Prius driving along. A month and a half later, December 2006, my cell phone rings. I don't recognize the number. And I never pick up the phone when I don't recognize the number. And the little voice goes, yeah, you're going to want to pick up this call. OK. Hello? Hi, Suzanne? Yes. Uh, this is Libby from Oprah Winfrey's office. Oh, I started driving like an Asian. I'm like, no! Ah! <laughs> so I have to pull over. Oh. So she says, Suzanne, listen to me. I never, and I mean never, answer any mail that comes to Harpo. If you had any idea of the sheer volume of mail, that we get here, you would know, I never do this. And I said, well, I never pick up the cell phone when I don't recognize the number, but something told me to. And she goes, well, guess what? Last night, a friend of mine dragged me to his house and forced me to watch this DVD, The Secret. I loved it, never saw it before. I come into work the next morning, there is your package on top of my desk, top of the stack. Wow. So she said, so I had to call you, and I have to tell you that Oprah has not seen this movie. You're the first person to send it to her. What? This movie had been out for one year. How is that possible? Guess how it's possible. Everyone decided, eh, she's sick. So, someone else will take care of it. No, no one else apparently did, right? So she says, we're going to South Africa for six weeks, like we do every December. So I'm going to bring it with us and make sure she watches it. And I went, OK, I'll call you in six weeks. Bye. I hung up. But my car levitated the rest of the way. <laughs> the first point. What's happening right now? OK, so six weeks later, I'm having uh, coffee with my friend Lucinda at a coffee shop in North Hollywood, outdoors, sitting at a table waiting for her. She's running late. I'm sipping my green tea. And a man about 30 feet away with a bunch of his friends looks at me, stands up, walks over, pulls out the chair, sits down, and just says, hello. <laughs> and I say, hello. And he says, how are you? And I say, I'm blissful. How are you? And he goes, following my bliss. Good answer. So it bought him like five more seconds. And I'm like, and he says, 
have you ever seen the movie The Secret? And I said, what? Not only have I seen it, but I'm the first person to send it to Oprah. And he jumps up from his chair and starts running around, flailing his limbs around, screaming, oh my god, oh my god. And I said, what's the matter with you right now? What's happening? And he says, do you know that Oprah's doing a show about The Secret in two weeks? And I went, no, I didn't know that. How do you know that? And he goes, I go to Agape. And Reverend Michael Beckwith announced to the congregation that in two weeks he's flying to Chicago for the taping of the Oprah episode of The Secret. Oh, oh, oh my, okay, so now I want to call over to Harpo, but it's 6 p.m. LA time, 8 p.m. Chicago time, too late. So anyway, he ends up having his friends join me and Lucinda. We talk about the law of attraction all night long. Great, next morning, I call Libby. Libby, it's Suzanne Huang. Oh my God, I hear you're doing a show about The Secret. Please, I want to come be in the studio audience. I'm so excited. Yay, 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 right? And I leave her that message and I send her an email. And then I go to the Sundance Film Festival and I come back and I've forgotten all about it. And I realize, wait a minute, it's January 29th and the taping of the show is January 31st. It's Monday and the taping's Wednesday. I haven't heard back from Libby. Now, luckily, I read The Four Agreements by Don Miguel Ruiz, and it says, don't take anything personally. Because I could have gone, Libby's a bitch, and she doesn't want me to call her, and I hate her guts, and she hates me, bleh. and I'm like, no, no, don't take that personally. She's just busy, right? She wants me to come. Yeah, she wants me to come. She's just busy. So I'm there, and I'm like, OK, I need an idea, divine idea. I'm just going to go. Yeah, I'm going to go. With no invitation, I'm just going to go. Yeah, OK. So I get on the internet, JetBlue.com. It turns out JetBlue has just opened a terminal at Chicago's O'Hare Airport. I'm not kidding you. January of 2007. Boom, 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 boom. 400 bucks, round trip the night before. Wow. Right? The universe is conspiring in my favor. You know that quote, right? So where am I going to stay? I haven't been to Chicago in 20 years. I've been watching Oprah for how long? At the end of every Oprah, she does a voiceover promo. Do you know what she says? Guests of the Oprah Winfrey Show stay at the Omni Hotel. Omni Hotel. I'm not a guest of the Oprah Winfrey Show, but I'm going to treat myself like one. I'm going to prepave the way. La, 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 la. Yay, so I have a room. Perfect. So now my plan is, tomorrow I'm going to fly there, and I'm going to take a cab from the airport to Harpo, and I'm going to take my clothes off and set my hair on fire and sing the Star Spangled Banner or whatever to get their attention because I'm getting a seat. So I, now I call Libby and I say, Libby, uh, I, I arranged for everything. You don't have to pay for anything. You don't have to arrange anything. I've got a flight and a hotel. All I need is a seat for my little yellow ass to sit in at the taping. <laughs> That's all. That's all I want. And I'm going to use the law of attraction to manifest that. I know you're going to manifest that for me. So the next day, my friend Star, who's sitting right here, is driving me to Long Beach Airport. And the phone rings. And it says Oprah Winfrey's office, because I'm not stupid. I plug that in. I'm like, hello? And I hear uh, it's the producer of this secret episode of the Oprah show. And he says, I got your information from Libby. And I wanted you to know that we'd be honored to have you join us. And we have a seat reserved for you. Oh, and I'm like, yeah. that's a good thing, Terry, because I'm on my way to the airport. <laughs> He also tells me that when Oprah really likes a topic and she loves this topic, she will frequently do an Oprah after the show for 30 minutes on the Oxygen Network. And if she does that, that would be the time to raise my hand and you know, see if I can tell her part of my story. So I fly over to Chicago. The flight felt like it took 10 seconds. It was like, whoosh, I'm there, yes. So I'm at the Omni Hotel, standing in line, waiting to check in. And I realize I'm standing directly behind Jack Canfield, who wrote Chicken Soup for the Soul. Uh. And I blurt out, hey, you're from The Secret. I'm thinking, I must be vibing high, because look who I'm standing next to. This is awesome. <laughs> so he turns around, and I introduce myself. And I say, my name is Suzanne Huang. And um, I introduced Oprah to The Secret. And he says, oh my god, Suzanne, you're the reason why we're all here. And I went, I know. <laughs> So then he introduces me to his wife, Inga. And by the way, of course he's staying there. Guests of the Oprah Winfrey show stay at the Omni Hotel. But I didn't think that far. I just needed a place to stay. So Inga comes over, and I say, oh, is this your wife, Inga, who you rave about in The Secret? And he says, yes. And she says, yes. And then I get to tell them that the very first Chicken Soup for the Soul book, if you don't know, it's these 
a series of books. It's all short, one to two page inspirational true stories. The only one I ever read was the very first one, Chicken Soup for the Soul. Now they have Chicken Soup for the Dental Assistant. I didn't mean that one. So, Chicken Soup for the Soul. I get to tell Jack and Inga that the first time I ever read it, I was on an airplane. And I'm, and I'm a big sap. As you can tell, I've been crying like already for half an hour. So, I'm reading Chicken Soup for the Soul on an airplane, and there's this one story that just got me about this little boy who goes to a pet store to adopt a puppy, to, to buy a puppy. And he points to one and says, how much for this one? And the pet store owner goes, oh, that one's crippled. You can just take that one for free. And the little boy says, no, I want to pay full price for that puppy. What's full price? So the pet store owner tells him. The boy leaves, saves up the money, eventually comes back and buys this puppy. And as he's leaving with the puppy, the pet store owner says, OK, but I just have to ask you, what do you want that puppy for? That puppy's useless. And the little boy slowly lifts up his pant leg, and he has a prosthetic leg. And he says, I want that puppy to be raised by someone who understands him. And I'm like, oh, my god. That's a real story. So I tap the guy on the shoulder who's next to me, wearing a three-piece suit, very uptight. I'm like, you have to read this story. <laughs> ah. And he's looking at me like, Crasian, get away from me, right? I'm like, no, it's one page. You have to read it. And I think just to, so I would leave him alone, he takes the book, right? And he, he reads the story, and he gets to the end. And I swear to God, he goes, ah. He's just bawling. We pass it down the row, nine people in the row bawling. And I get to tell Jack and Inga this story. It was so much fun. It was fantastic, right? So then it's like, OK, great. Have a great night. See you tomorrow morning at the taping. Yay. I check into my room. They check into their room. And by the way, the universe has provided for me to be upgraded to a suite. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. So it's a beautiful suite. I'm so exhausted. I cannot wait to just get into my pajamas, order room service, watch something on TV, and go to sleep because I have to wake up early. And I'm not an early morning girl at all. So now the divine voice comes in again. And this time they say, yeah, now you're going to want to walk to the hotel phone, pick it up, call the operator, dial Jack Canfield's room, and see what he and Inga are doing for dinner tonight. Oh and I went, no, no. <laughs> the first time I was like, no, I'm not curious about doing that. I just had a perfect conversation with them. I am tired, and I don't want to overstep my bounds because that was perfect. So no, I'm not going to do that. And they said, shut up and get out of the way and do it. So I'm thinking, oh no, I can never resist a challenge like that. They've thrown down the gauntlet. So my heart's now pounding because I'm in resistance, right? I'm like, ah. So I go over to the phone, hotel phone, dial the operator, it rings. I say, Jack Canfield's room, hoping that you know he's under an alias or something. No. <laughs> Ring straight through. Hello. Hi, Jack. This is Suzanne Wong. We just met in the lobby. Yes, we did. All friendly. So I say, listen, I know it's a long shot, but what are you and Inga doing for dinner tonight? And he says, well, Suzanne, all of the panelists from The Secret are getting together in the hotel restaurant at 7 p.m. Let me call you back. So I hang up. He calls me back in a few minutes. He says, I've explained to everyone that you're the reason why we're all here. We'd be honored to have you join us as our guest for dinner tonight. <laughs> See you at 7. So now, instead of room service dinner by myself, I'm now sitting at the freaking holy grail of high vibing people <laughs> at dinner. And I look up and I'm like, you guys are good. My guides rock, right? <laughs> so it's where I met Reverend Michael Beck with James Ray, Lisa Nichols, and Jack Canfield, and all their significant others. We are at a rectangular table for 10. And there are nine people in their party, ladies and gentlemen. There was an empty seat. There would have just been an empty seat, and that seat belonged to me. We had an incredible three-hour dinner. The next morning, I go to the hotel lobby at 7.30 AM to take a cab over to Harpo, right? Except they all happen to be there at the, exactly the same time, getting into their stretch limos that Oprah provided. So I say, hey, any room in any of those limos? <laughs> one empty available seat in one of the limos. So now I'm with my new best friends riding in a stretch limo to Harpo Studios. <laughs> the taping, as you probably know, was incredible. It was incredible to be in that room. I was second row center. Afterwards, she did do an Oprah after the show. I raised my hand. and. Uh, uh, told her the story so quickly that I'm surprised anybody un understood what I was saying because I was so excited. And uh, yeah, raised my hand and told her the story. And she confirmed that I was the first person to send it to her. But she said that after my copy made it into her hands, six different people that day told her she had to watch it. She didn't wait till South Africa. She went home that night and watched it. 
And so after that was all over, she had the secret panelists get on stage with her for individual photo opportunities. And I'm sitting there going, I want my picture taken with Oprah. <laughs> so I raise my hand and say, Oprah, can I get my picture taken with you? And she goes, get up here, Suzanne. So I'm having my picture taken with her. They say they'll Federal Express it to me. It is not until I'm on the flight from Chicago back to LA that I remember that four months before this, I had cut out a photo of me and scotch taped it next to a photo of Oprah and put it in my magical creation box. And now I have a real photo of me and Oprah hanging in my living room. And that is my Oprah secret story. I've gone over, so I want to uh, end with a song. But before I do, I just want to say that that story is just proof that a small gesture done with great love and clear high intention can absolutely change the world. So any small gesture that you have in mind to change the world, please take action and do it. OK, Lisa, hit it. Switch my mics, please. Uh, this is a song, by the way, by Karen Drucker. I've rewritten most of the lyrics with her permission. And uh, I'm no James Higgins, so just indulge me. OK. <laughs> This morning, something was not right. My poor head was a throbbing cause I tossed and turned all night. This unfamiliar feeling that shook me up inside. The truth it was revealing that a part of me had died. So I called my higher self. She gave me the bad news. She said, your life is just too good. You lost the right to sing the blues. That broken down old Chevy that was eating gas alive. I visualized a Prius and now it's sitting in my drive. And those men I fell in love with who were passive all the time. I dumped them for an alpha male and now I feel sublime. Well, everywhere I looked, I was confronted with the clues. My life is too darn good. I lost the right to sing the blues. You can sing the blues if you can't pay the rent. And you can sing the blues if you despise the president. But I can't sing the blues. I ain't got no excuse. When the 405's wide open on the way to my masseuse. So you won't hear me whining to my girlfriends on the phone. And you won't see me crying when I find myself alone. I'm too busy meditating and chanting namaste and counting all my blessings. Honey, that could take all day. Now that I know the secret, I'm changing all my views. When life's fantabulastic, you just cannot sing the blues. Thank you again to Reverend David Fears, to Chef, to Sue, to Lisa, um, to Robert, my boyfriend especially, to all my friends who came out, to everyone I know from Silomar, to Brian, to James Higgins, and the Malibu Teen Youth Camp. All right. Thank you very much. Okay, here's the big closing. Ready? So you can stay standing. Just get into it. Ready? Whoa. You can sing the blues when you're convicted of a crime. And you can sing the blues when you are married to a slime. But what gives me the right to gossip and complain when I got a first class ticket on the mad malicious train? So now you know my story and you understand my plight. I'm searching and not finding any way to pick a fight. Cause my stars are in alignment My house is all feng shui I'm filled with joy and laughter And my bills have all been paid I've let go of the struggle I signed up for a cruise My life is just too good I lost the right to sing the blues